that children are uh, we're all 
they could see. But that is just one cycle. And we want to go through several of these cycles in a, uh, in a, in a night. And with each cycle that you go through, you get deeper and more absorbed to sleep. So even that one cycle, the next cycle will be deeper and will be better for you. So how much sleep do you need? So the amount of sleep that you need decreases with age, so you need less than your kids. And actually, when you've got kids of different ages, you put them to bed at different times, that's normal. But teenagers need nine to nine and a half hours of less. And if you track that back, if they're getting up at six o'clock, that means they need to be in bed by nine o'clock. I would tell if they go uh, deeper to sleep at night. How often? They're 16 or 17. And how do you think 16 or 17? I'm sure you're 15 and 16. 15? Yeah, 15. Oh, no. Yeah. And uh, how do you achieve that? It's really difficult to get 15 and 16. How do you do that? Well, we have to pay. We'll get the FBA speaking. It's not the subject of it. Well, sometimes it is. But then it is a margin of our own way back. And have they accepted that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they do. Now they accept the digital routine and it goes parallel to this uh, having the, the gadgets. And it looks fine and we see the change. And for example, if they have a sleepover, they look the next day and really see the difference. It, it, it really is a very good, good way to, to, to follow this. Um, I have uh, a few boys, I'm, I'm always definitely seeing them. Somebody saw me on holiday, I, I was here. Someone saw me on holiday uh, with my son last week and said, Is that the son that you always talk about in your book? And I said, In front of him, I said, No, no, that's the other one. <laughs> um, but yeah, two kids and uh, I, I can see age 18, I would go into their bedroom, get their gadgets, and it's 10 o'clock because we start to school a bit later, get their gadgets, pull the plugs out, tell them it's time to sleep, go to sleep, it's non-negotiable, you know, and I think how all we'll things I did to parents, I am quite liberal many respects, uh, all the things that I did as a parent, that was one of the most important things that I did. I'll, I'll, I'll show you why. So, um, the reason they need to, to sleep is because when they are asleep, their immune system is reinforced. The cell damage is taken care of. They will not be as sick. They will not catch things. And there is a book recently, which I've just ordered, which I will be able to tell you more about it next, next time we talk about sleep, that has tracked the long-term effects of uh, short-changing sleep, because this is a new phenomenon, it's, this is a 21st century phenomenon, because we've got the lighting, we've got the technology, and all of these things, different parenting styles, where we're not enforcing them. And they have found that there is a connection between long-term illnesses, illnesses later on in life like cancer, problems with the immune system, and they believe that it is connected to the amount of sleep people get. So even if you know, think you're creating a good student by allowing them to stay up all hours to work, Think about their long term future as well, and also I'm, I'm going to argue that you're not helping them to live with children either because there's problems with learning. Anyway, so during this intense rest, your energy levels on the field is replenished, so the next day you've got much more energy, um, which obviously is extremely important for them to reach their potential so that they can access everything that there is going on at school. Hormones, the growth hormones come online when they're asleep. So for normal growth and development to keep pace with them, they need to 
sleep because the growth hormones only work at night. Then metabolism, this is very important. We have found that obesity is linked to a lack of sleep. Um, their metabolism is regulated when they are asleep. Same as you. So if, you, if there is a problem with weight, or if you want them to be fit and healthy, you need to make sure they get enough sleep. Again, metabolism is regulated during the night time. Um, right, so the brain. They, they don't learn if they don't sleep. The reason being is the filing system takes place at night. So everything that they learn gets filed away. And as we know, if we don't file, we can't find. And if we can't find, we haven't learned it because it's not available to us. So you need, the kids need to sleep in order to file what they've learned at night. This, uh, this process definitely happens at night time. Um, the other process that happens at night time is procedural memory is rehearsed. So if anybody, I, I, I can relate this to two aspects of my life. One was uh, learning French and the other one was learning to ski. Because all night when I was fully immersed in French and had to learn it, I was just, all the phrases that I learned at that day were going round and round and round my head. I'm sure you've all had that experience. And also learning to ski. I was really skiing all the runs, I was doing the turns, I was going over and over and over them again. The reason why is because our procedural memory comes online. So if you want to learn anything like music, if you want to learn anything like algorithms for maths, if you want to learn anything like languages, all of that gets rehearsed at night. And that those neural pathways are activated at night time, not during the day. Okay? So it's really, really important that they're getting enough to see for those if you want them to be several trends of. Their mind is, after a good night's sleep, is more creative because the energy reaches their potential and their focus is so much better so that they're able to make these new connections and learn this information. They emotionally, they have much more perspective. You know, if your child has not had a good night's sleep, they tend to be very highly reactive and not to be able to um, regulate their emotions. They can get angry, they can get upset, they're not thinking so logically because their brain hasn't got the energy to do that. So they need to sleep, okay? At least you want them to be calm as well. Um, so, Briefly, the consequences of not getting enough sleep is their, their long-term memory. They will find it hard to remember things because the body system doesn't work. They'll have irregular moods, which may lead to significant problems like behaviour problems and depression. If they're ongoing, if it's ongoing and they're not getting enough sleep, we can, uh, have, that can have consequences for their mental health their concentration, their ability to focus will decrease if they're not getting enough sleep. They get more stressed and have significantly higher levels of anxiety. Now, anecdotally, I know this because every student I have in my office, when I dig down, not every, that's an exaggeration, most, when I dig down into their routine and find out what's been going on, they may have been there at one o'clock the night before. Um, and, you know, some brilliant students. I had a student in my office the other day, a brilliant mathematician in the sixth floor, doing amazing news, still fantastic results. He goes to bed, he gets, he said, he's very proud of himself. I go to bed, I only need three to four hours a night. I'm staying up because I love math and I want to, I haven't got time to follow, to, to learn this new stuff, so I'm doing it at night and I've got some time. Another amazing student I know, uh, musician, well, composed, wakes up in the middle of the night and composes music. Now that sounds amazing, doesn't it? But after I finished with him, he was getting at least seven hours a night because this is not sustainable in the long term. And all those processes, he's okay now. Wait until he goes to university, or wait until he has a very challenging 
uh, time in his life, he's going to need that energy. And school's not difficult for him right now, but life is going to throw him some curveballs, and he won't be in a good pattern where he's And also, I'm very concerned about his physical health, short term, long term, both of them. So, um, that, you know, even though a child seems to be succeeding extremely well, there are long term effects of not getting enough sleep as well. A lot of students tell me, oh, well, I can't, I can't get that much sleep because I'm doing my homework. So then your kids tell you that, you know, I can't go to bed. Well, that's a time management issue. Um, you need to have water to shed for them. Like, this is the time, the homework's not done then. You have to take consequences for that. They will soon get their time management issue sorted out if you if you hold that right to them. Okay? So, metabolism is affected. If they're not getting enough sleep, that can lead to obesity. Growth, the normal growth and development, remember, they need to be asleep because of the growth hormone comes online then. And their immune system. If your child is regularly sick and complaining about being sick, just check that they're getting the required hours of sleep because that is very, very closely linked. And even if they're not, remember, even if they're not sick now, short changing on sleep for the long term is very, very serious for the long term well being of the immune system. So, very, very important. So, how do you get them to go to sleep? As wonderful parents told us, you have to negotiate with them. Look, we're telling the kids about the effects of screens and technology on them on their sleep. We are doing ours, we're trying to do our part. You you know this now, you need to reinforce that with them. They need to turn off their screens and their technology, including their smartphones. And teenagers, it's like separating them from their I don't know, their, hip or something, trying to get the phone off them, but they, if you explain the science, good parents are wise parents, and their kids get that you're wise. They know that you're doing it out of knowledge, wisdom, they know that you're doing it for their good. You're not doing it to be difficult, you're not doing it to be unpleasant, you're doing it because you care about them and because you understand the science, and they should understand the science. So there shouldn't be a lot of problems around it, okay? Get the technology out of their bedroom at the watershed time that they need to go to sleep. Because it's like you just said, which was a brilliant analogy. You don't put a bottle of gin in front of an alcoholic and say, don't touch that bottle of gin, don't drink. But you don't have technology in their bedroom and say, don't touch that phone and don't put that computer on, okay? Because they're addicted. Our kids are addicted. They are. And, and, and technology is fantastic, and we use it a lot, um, and so it sounds like we're being hypocritical. One of the things that comes up in my uh, parent workshop constantly is the question, and we'll talk about it a bit more, the question of modelling. And I'm, I, I don't wish to be rude, but I do see a lot of you right now on the mobile phone. Um, you cannot model, you cannot expect your children to respect your rules unless you model them. So things like, you know, if you say no technology at the dinner table, then it has to be for you to, you know, if you say oh, it's no technology in the bedroom, then you will think that there's no technology in your bedroom. You know, those sort of things. So the more you can be consistent, the better. So these computer screens emit a, a light which interferes with sleep hormones, so you need to get them off an hour before they go to sleep, or that natural process will not take place. Um, so, very, very quickly, things that help to get a good night's sleep. You fix that, that bedtime and waking you time, and you know, teenagers, they love to stay up all day and all night. At uh, the weekend, and then they sleep all day the next day. Now, if they stay up a bit later, that's absolutely fine. No one's going to say, you know, that's not a good idea. However, if they 
they are all night at the weekend. You are breaking the natural the pattern that you've established over the week and it disturbs the whole process and they will find it difficult. Now there are a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of research around adolescents wanting to be nocturnal. That there seems to be a process in the brain where they want to stay up late and they want to sleep in late. There is some evidence that this is true, but it's been exaggerated. It's been exaggerated. If you, a lot of it is social. They want to stay up at night because their parents are asleep and they can get them and do whatever they want. To be honest, that is a lot of the reason they want to be. They, a lot of it is social. A lot of it is because they can, they have their own, their own rules, their own time when you're asleep and they're up. Um, so it's been exaggerated, and as long as you get the right, as long as they have a pattern that they stick to, then it has less of an impact. If you allow them to stay up all night and sleep all day at weekends, it has much more of an impact. Okay. So caffeine has a half life, I think, of eight hours or something like that. I never drink coffee after midday because it's still in your system. They really right through until you want to go to bed, so I think 12 hours actually. So you don't, with, similarly with the children, discourage them drinking caffeine. But also, uh, sugar is a stimulant, so sugary drinks and things like that, you need to avoid those. You need, they need to exercise regularly, like I said, but not right before bedtime. If they are doing practice, Ten o'clock at night, that is not good for them because that raises their metabolism, their, their, their metabolism, it can raise adrenaline, it can raise competitive scores, and all of those things which interfere with the sleep process. So look at their schedules for that. As I talked about temperature and blocking out distracting noise, eliminate. I, I actually now sleep with a, a mask on because there's lights in the bedroom, there's a light on the alarm. Like on the street outside, I total darkness, and so do the kids. So make sure they've got blackout blinds, things like that. Bananas are really good if they're hungry before they go to bed because they have um, something in them. I can't remember the name right now. Off the top of my head, that induces sleep. We do relaxation techniques. So. There is, if, if they really, really do have problems sleeping, there's a wonderful app that you can get, that, and there's some free things on it, and one of the free things, free things on it is sleep story. And a, a student, a student, I sometimes forget what I told you, that the student went to see me last week, he had a lot of problems sleeping, and he said, I'm fine now, and I said, well, why? And he said, because I'm listening to these stories on car. I said, wow, how did you find that? He said, oh, well, you told me. That was reassuring. Tell them, if they find it hard going to sleep, there's this, this app called Calm.com and there are stories on there that will then not sleep. Um, and you too, because it's adults as well. Um, so, but the problem with that, do you see the problem with that? In order to listen to that, they have to have some technology in their room. So, yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's my only problem with it, but if, if they're really, really having problems sleeping, that, that does work. But you have to make sure that that's all it's for, okay? Okay, so we're going to come on to the second part of the talk. Perfect timing, it's half past eight. Has anybody got any questions about sleep before we go on? I think that I'm sorry to be a bit um, lecturing about this, but I feel that it is so, so significant and important. And when I was putting this together and thinking about, okay, what I'm going to say about how to reach your potential, I, I might as well not do the rest of the talk unless you get that piece of it, it is that important. And we spend a third of our time in sleep for good reason. For good reason. So please, if there's any of you, if any of you are really struggling with any with, um, your children in this area, and if, you, if that, they've got a lot of problems in this area, then I'm only too willing to help and so my system. We're here to do for that.
Right, resilience. So resilience is the ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. We're all going to have hard times in life. I'm very open about I have many. I'm sure you have. We're all going to lose people. We're all going to have significant hurdles to get over in life. Challenges. And your children are too. Because this is life. This is what it's about. Resilient people are able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult situations. You know, it, it's bouncing back. It may take time. The hardest challenges take a lot of time sometimes to get over. But if they are resilient, they will get over it. One of the amazing research being done at the moment is to, everyone's heard of growth, uh, post-traumatic stress, yes? Yeah? Post-traumatic stress, you know, that there's a lot more bad effects happen after you've had some catastrophic events in your life. Well, that, now the research has moved on and uh, into what they, what they call post-traumatic growth. So what they found is, okay, there's some people that have these terrible events in their life and have post-traumatic stress. But there's many that have terrible events in their life and go on to achieve incredible things. And this seems to have an effect on certain people that is energizing, motivating, and they get their perspectives in order. They begin to start to um, know what they truly care about and value, and they start moving towards that. I'm going to show you a video now. It's very sensitive. Um, I came, I came across this, Stephanie and Keith technology. I came across it on Facebook last week. And I was putting this together and I saw this short one and I've gone away and I've watched the longer version. I really recommend it. I've got lots of resources for you that are attached to this presentation and there's going to be uh, an article in the newsletter where you can access all of that. So you don't need to um, worry about that. You've got all of that. I really recommend you watch this man talking um, in the longer version because it is incredible. He, so he is dying and he has died of um, cancer. He has three young children. This is really, really a, a blow for him. He was a professor in technology at one of an eminent university in the state, a beloved professor of many, many students. He thought he, he was so energetic and enigmatic that uh, he went on when he got this diagnosis to do lectures called what he called the last lecture. So he, he in the last few months of his life, he went around and delivered the last lecture. And this is an extract from it. The reason I'm showing you it was when I saw it, I thought, oh my goodness, this is everything that I'm going to tell the, te the, the parents next week. So, but in layman's terms. So after that, we're going to take a little bit of what he talks about and we're going to talk to you about it more from um, parenting, parenting perspective and from the positive psychology research. So we'll watch this now. You can't do anything about the fact that I'm going to die. I've been fighting pancreatic cancer. It has now come back after surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. The doctors tell me there's nothing more to do and I have months to live. I don't like this. I have three little kids. Let's be clear, this stinks. But I can't control the cards I'm dealt, just how I play the hand. Now, if I'm not morose enough for you, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I don't choose to be an object of pity. Today's talk is not about death, it's about life and how to live, specifically about childhood dreams and about how you can try to achieve them. As a child, I had an incredibly happy childhood. I went back and raided the photo album, and I couldn't find any places where I wasn't smiling. And I was dreaming, always dreaming. When I was eight, my family took the pilgrimage to Disneyland in California, and it was this incredible experience, the rides, the shows, the traffic, and everything. And I said, gosh, I'd like to make stuff like that when I get older. So I graduated from college, and I tried to become an Imagineer, just the people who make the magic. And I got a lovely rejection letter. 
But then the darndest thing happened. You know, I worked hard and worked hard, and I became a junior faculty member, and I specialized in doing certain kinds of research. That's me. And uh, I developed a skill that was valuable to Disney, and I got a chance to go there, and I was part of an imaginary team, and we worked on something called a lab magic problem. And it was incredibly cool. However, it took me over 15 years to do it, and lots and lots of tries. And what I learned from that is that the brick walls that are in our way are there for a reason. They are not there to keep us out. They are there to give us a way to show how much we want it. My dad, what an incredible guy. Uh, he fought in World War II. He was clearly part of the greatest generation. Sadly, my dad passed away a little over a year ago. And when my mother was going through this thing, that was when she discovered that in World War II, he was awarded the Bronze Star for Battle. In 50 years of marriage, it had just never come up. It was a real lesson in humility. Now, my mother. Mothers are people who love you when you pull their hair. And this was the kind of relationship I had with my mother. And my mother, speaking of humility, was always there to keep me in check. When I was going through graduate school and I was taking really hard examinations, I was home pretty much complaining and whining about how hard these PhD tests were. And she just patted my arm and she said, We know how you feel. Just remember that when your father was your age, he was fighting the Germans in World War II. Okay. Next thing, you better decide early on if you're a Tigger or an Eeyore. Tiggers are energetic, they're optimistic, they're curious, they're enthusiastic, and they have fun. And never, ever underestimate the importance of having fun. I am dying soon, and I am choosing to have fun today, tomorrow, and every other day I have fun. If you want to achieve your dreams, you better work and play well with others. And that means you better live with integrity. Simple advice that you'll find hard to follow, just tell the truth. Second thing, when you screw up, apologize. There are a lot of bad apologies in America. A good apology has three parts. I'm sorry, it was my fault, how do I make it right? Most people skip that third part. That's how you can tell sincerity. The last thing is that we all have people that we don't like, that have done things we don't like, and what I've found is no one is pure evil. If you wait long enough, they will show you their good side. And lastly, I don't think complaining and whining really solves the problem. This is Jackie Robinson, first black major leaguer, had it in his contract not to complain if people spit on him. Right? I don't care if you're Jackie Robinson or if you're a guy like me who's only got a couple of months to live, you can choose to take your finite time and energy and effort and you can spend it complaining or you can spend it playing the game hard, which is probably going to be more helpful to you. And it's important for you to know why I gave you this talk. The talk isn't just about how to achieve your childhood dream. It's much broader than that. It's about how to live your life. Because if you lead your life the right way, the karma will take care of itself. The dreams will come to you. Creates a pearl because then they produce this lacquer around him. I don't know, I'm not a biologist. 
offer if then the pearl is created. We need challenge in order to create the pearl. In order to come up with the good, we need challenge. The easier your kids' lives are, the less likely they are to develop uh, resilience. They need optimistic thinking style, as I he was talking, are they a Leo or are they a Tigger? We want them to be Tiggers, we want them to be enthusiastic. I'm going to talk to you about um, character strengths in a minute. The character strengths the most associated with resilience and resistance of uh, depression is that. That is a love of life. It's that feeling of when you wake up in the morning, yay, here's another day, what can I do with it? So we need to get the kids to have that feeling about their lives, that they're not just getting up and it's just uh, another day, here we go again. Perseverance, we talked about perseverance with the children this week, the secondary children, they need to keep going and they fall over, they need to get up, so how do we do that? Commitment, very, very important. Um, it comes up in parenting classes, should you allow your children to give up on things? I, I, I personally believe that if, a, if, a, if you sign up to something for a specific amount of time, you just, you're going to go, you're going to push through, you're going to go. Now, at Christmas, perhaps we can negotiate when you give that up. If I pay for a term for you to do something, then I expect you to go there. But that takes commitment from you. I remember with my kids, we had to get up really, really early every Saturday morning because they were committed to going to scouts and it was very inconvenient to get up and to take them to scouts at 7 o'clock in the morning. But we did it because they were committed and sometimes not very. We had to literally drag them out of bed to go. But the benefit for them to follow through to give service when they got older, they were looking after their younger, the younger scouts. was so important lessons in life, and I can see how that works out over time for them. And triumph over adversity is what resilience is all about. How do we get over the difficulties that we're going to have uh, in life? And I do think that parenting is to protect them from the difficulties of life. No one dares to down with them. But we can, first of all, I don't think that's our role because it's, it's impossible. So it's our job as parents is to give them the skills to cope, but not to protect. Okay. So there's three elements of resilience. One is positive emotion. So I've talked about mindfulness. To be aware of how they're getting hooked by their negative self-talk. Be aware of that so they can do something about it, okay? They need to be aware of it. Um, they need to accept some situations are not, they can't do much about, and that is difficult. But also they need to accept that they're going to have negative feelings sometimes, and that's okay because that's about being human. And one of the things about um, negative feelings is there's always the opposite side to it. So, for example, if you feel pain because of separation, it's because you care. So you can't care without having pain. So this is an important message to get across to your kids as well. You can't feel angry unless you commit to something and somebody is interfering with that. So negative emotion in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's what you do with it that is important. And that comes to engagement. Now, this guy is called, I have to Google how to say his name because it's so difficult. It's Mihai Chet Ben Mihai. Chet Ben Mihai. And he's a total man. I've got his, um, I've got references to him as well at the bottom. He talks about flow. Flow is the psychological state when you're totally in the zone, 100% committed to something that you're passionate about. You lose all sense of time and you are totally, and it's often something that you're really, really um, 
talented in or passionate about, but not necessarily. It's just something that you feel a great affinity with. And he has looked into a lot of research about this, and, and the, the woman who wrote the, the grit book has found that for most of the people, they have a passion and they follow through. We, it came up in the parenting class, we were talking about tutoring. Tutoring for passion, I am all for it. If you can get these kids to get this sense of flow, this student that stays up all night working math problems, he only has tutoring for math. He doesn't need it because he's a brilliant student and he gets, he gets the top grade. But he's so passionate about his subject, he's asked his parents for extra tuition to bring him to a level which he would not be able to achieve um, unless he had that. There's a man called Vygotsky, who the teachers know about him, I'm sure, who talks about true learning is in the zone where you can't do it independently. You need a little bit of, you need scaffolding and a little bit of help to get onto the next level. Tutoring for that is fantastic. If you are, your kids are being tutored but they're not concentrating enough in class, there's a problem there. They don't need that. I have students coming into my office saying, I don't concentrate there because I've got tutors, I'll do it with them when I get home. First of all, you're paying a lot of money for this education, and second of all, that's wasting so much of their time. Um, so we need to get that piece right, I think. Committed action. They need to, like, to go back to the scouts, they need to follow through. And they need meaning in their life. Um, the meaningful life consists in belonging to and being connected to something that, you, that is bigger than yourself. So it's about the connection to your values and having good values and, and seeing them through. So that's... Now, optimists... You've seen this slide before. Optimists tend to see events and the world as a half full glass. So they tend to focus on what there is there and what's positive about it. Whereas pessimists tend to see the world as half empty. What's missing, what's gone wrong, what happens, what's not going right. Okay? The optimists, they don't always blame themselves or view failure as long lasting. So, for example, if it's badly in a test, they don't say, well, I'm stupid, that is why I did badly. They say, I didn't do enough work. I wasn't prepared enough. There were questions on there I'd never ever seen before or couldn't have prepared for. They don't they don't see their intelligence as fit. They see that it can be improved for them to work. This is the sort of self talk that we need to help our children develop. They're not it's not fit. They see overcoming problems as a challenge rather than freaking out, worrying getting upset about it. It's a challenge. Okay, how am I going to go about it? This part of the brain, how am I going to engage this part of my brain to logically go through the steps to achieve this? That's what resilient people do. They, and they don't get discouraged by this negative self-talk that, that, that continues to run in their brain. Uh, if you went to the mindfulness talk, you'll know that I sort of the analogy is that the brain is like a, a radio transmitting negative stuff at you all the time. And mindfulness teaches us to disconnect from that and to go in line with our, our values and to commit to action and to uh, push through and overcome. So they don't get hooked by that. You can't switch it off, by the way. Um, so if they, if they do say negative things, we're going to. I'm going, to teach, I'm going to tell you a little bit how to um, retrain them. Okay, so the, the example I always give to students is if somebody is the, the young kid, they really get it, okay? Right from young kids up to the, the, the oldest. So, an easy example somebody that you know really, really well, that you think of as a friend, walks past you on the Astro Club and totally ignores you. What do you think? So, some kids say they don't like me anymore. Um, they've got a problem with me. Um, you know, they're ignoring me. 
okay? Some kids say that. That is a pessimistic thinking science. Other children will say, it's, uh, they've probably got something on their mind, they're having a bad day, they didn't see me. That's an optimistic thinking science. Why? Because one has a very negative impact on you. If you think it's because they don't like you, you're going to get a hit to your self-esteem. You're going to feel bad. If you think it's because there's something about that the other person, there's going to be no effect on the self-esteem. You might feel slight concerns for them, but you're not going to do, uh, it's not going to impact you negatively. That's the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, okay? You can test your kids at home. See what they tell you when you ask them that question. Okay. But you can change it. So if something bad happens, like somebody walks past you and ignores you, hey, that's an adverse situation. Your beliefs are the most important thing. It was it because they hate you now, or was it because they were preoccupied? Okay? That's the that's very, very important thing. The consequences on you are either positive or negative. Now what you can do is go to C instead of leaving that and you dispute. So if your child says this sort of thing to you, you can say, you can say back to them, well, yeah, maybe they don't mind you anymore, or maybe, but what else could it be? Okay? The truth is not important. What's important is that you get them to start thinking flexibly about difficulty and challenge. And this applies to all areas of life. Now, one of the things that parents do because they're, they're trying to be good parents and they're trying to be helpful and because we all have an extra brain. You, you do, I do, kids do. You're wired. When they walk through the door, they capture your attention very, very quickly when you t they tell you what went wrong today and what they're upset about. They capture your attention. They don't capture your attention so much when they tell you something nice or positive. And you, this is a problem. This is a problem because it's reinforcing pessimism. And just, if, if, if you come away with nothing today, just when you go home and you're with your kids, just be aware. Be aware, be more aware of what captures your attention. What do you listen to? Is it the positive stuff or the negative stuff? That is not to say you don't listen must show that we care and we're listening, but how, how much? You must be careful about that, okay? Because this is teaching them a pessimistic thinking style. It's what they get attention for, it's negative. You've got to model posit positive and optimistic coping strategies yourself. So if you freak out when there's something stressful happens in your life, um, don't expect your kids to see it as a challenge to overcome and systematically go through because they're going to freak out too. Um, so just be careful with that as well. I wish I knew this stuff when I was bringing up my kids, but never mind. Um, encourage, and this is in the positive psychology research, that this really, really helps to develop optimism. If you encourage children to think and imagine, write even, about their best self, if there were no obstacles in their way and they could achieve their dreams, what would they be like? And get them to reflect on that. This also flushes out their values and their goals, what they actually care about. And resilient people have values that they're moving towards and they have goals that they set themselves, medium, short, medium and long term. Um, focus on what, what went, went well. I, I, what an easy way to do this, and I know that there's some parents are taking this on board and it's really, really had a massive impact on their kids. The kids do positivity journaling. So, uh, in order to rebalance this negative mindset that we have, three things that went well today. With lots of detail about it in a beautiful journal. A girl, the student who was struggling socially, brought me her positivity journal last week. Her mother has brought it absolutely beautiful. With, with her, her name and positivity journal on stickers on the front, beautiful journal, and I looked inside, it was gorgeous. Um, it, and it's a story of her positive life now. 
and the negative stuff doesn't belong in the journal, and this exists, but she's got that to reflect on. Um, and it works, it really, really works. This is all in the research as well. Encourage them to know and use their strengths. There are 24 character strengths that are universal, that we, that, and if you want to find out what they, what they are, and there are questionnaires for you and for your children that you can access online and our reference and search of options. The more your children know their strengths, the more resilient and the more the happier they will be and the more they will reach their potential. If you find out what your character strengths are and you, you work with your signature strengths on a daily basis and you incorporate them into your life, and those being your top five, top six strengths, uh, more you will achieve your potential. But if you don't know what, if, if your kids don't know, and I, keep, I do um, give a lot of the secondary students this questionnaire because it's important for them to know this information. If you don't know, if your kids don't know, then do access those things, things online and find out. Um, you must praise effort and embrace failure as a parent. You, if, you, if you give them the impression that failure is a problem, then they will freak out. They, they want to please you. If they fail or have difficulty, and they try, and, and that worries them because of your reaction. I, I see so many students terrified about their results, terrified about taking it, taking it home. I see students who have got straight A's at GCSE, but got one C, and when they see me in September, all they can talk about is C, because their parents went mad, they didn't get straight A's. They don't celebrate their successes, they're, they, they're, they're developing a pessimistic thinking style by only, only focusing on the negative about their achievements and not the positive. How is that helping them to reach their potential? It is ridiculous when you think about it. We need to celebrate their successes and praise their effort, not talent and intelligence. You don't say, oh, you're really, really clever, you're incredible, you're amazing. No. You put in loads of effort there and look what, look what you achieve. If you give the kids the idea that, that you're either talented or not, you're intelligent or not, right, then they will feel that there's no point. They're not good at that, or they're not good at sport, or they're not good at music. So we never use that language with them. You want them to reach their potential. They can be good at anything, but it's the amount of commitment and the amount of effort that they put in. That is the essential part. Okay, so this is what this is language we need to use with, with them. They, we need to teach them then to react to failure and mistakes as a setback and a learning opportunity. Okay, you didn't do well in that test. Why is that? I wasn't prepared. I didn't enough work. Um, it was too hard. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. So, let's look at why it's too hard for you. What skills were you lacking? What knowledge did you have? Okay? Setback and a learning opportunity, not, um, not saying, right, you're a failure. This is, um, you know, this is fixed. This is fixed mentality. I mean, we've all heard about growth mindset when we try and teach children here. That's not fixed. Move it, move it on. I haven't got time to do this now um, because it's nine o'clock, but I'm going to get you all to put up ten fingers and to think of ten things that you're grateful for right now. I really, really would suggest that you get your kids to do that on a, a daily basis. Ten things that you're grateful for right now. Gratitude builds resilience. It, in all the research, the more grateful that they are, the more aware they are of their. Um, of the things, of the positive things in their life. Again, you're creating this positive mindset. You're creating positive pathways in their brain. You can shape their brain. You literally can. All the research shows you can by addressing these areas. Teach them to help others because not just 
put it good for its own sake. We should all be doing something for other people. But if you care about your kids, it reinforces important values, which will guide them in life. It has benefits uh, neurologically. It touches the pleasure centers in their brain when they are kind and helpful to other people. Okay? And it, it, has, it makes them feel good about themselves because they, they, look, they feel like they're decent human beings and it increases their self-esteem. So if we want them to reach their full potential, we have to teach them to be kind and to help other people and to empathize. And to do things altruistically, i.e. not expecting rewards just because um, they want to be good people. And this will help them in life, really, really help them in life. And finally, parenting styles that don't help build resilient children. I don't think anybody here, just by the fact that you're here, are neglectful. So we can leave that one. Neglectful parents are the ones that don't engage, let their kids do what they want, um, farm them out to the house, don't literally get involved with them. So, permissive parents are parents who don't have many boundaries or rules. Uh, they love their children, they've got a high degree of warmth towards them, but they're not supportive because they don't demand enough. So, hopefully, I don't believe any of you are here. Some of you may be here. On the outside, I don't think that really on the inside this is who you are, otherwise you wouldn't be here either. But authoritarian parents, very, very high in terms of demands and expectations, and don't show much warmth. They're the sort of parents who say, my way or the highway, I'm the boss here, not you, you'll do it the way I say, or all those sorts of things. Some of you may have partners if you think you're on the authoritarian side, that comes up a lot. And there's going to be conflict there with the parents. So they're not good. Curling parents, you know the sport curling, where you brush the ice so it's nice and smooth so that it can move along. Parents who do that, who brush the ice for their kids, get rid of all the obstacles and difficulties, they're not going to make pearls for those kids. It's going to be no grit for them. So, not good parenting. Um, helicopter parents, they zoom in and they remove the problems or they solve it for the children. They're always trying to take care of and look after and pick up pieces after them. Uh, you know, do their homework for them, guilty, you know, organise their agendas, do or everything for them. Uh, do not, they're not good parenting styles. The parenting style that builds resilience by far is the wise or authoritative parenting style, not authoritarian, but authoritative. And they have very high demands and expectations of their kids. That's fine, yeah? But they're very supportive and they're warm. They accept failure as a challenge. They don't crucify their kids if they mess up. They teach them optimistic thinking style. There is a sense of uh, ownership democracy in the household so that there, are, there is still possibility in the negotiation and that the kids will feel part of the team. And they model really, really consistent uh, values and behaviour. Uh, it's not do what I say, not as I do, it's I'll do what I say and expect me to do the same. So that's it. There is a load of resources that you can access and um, please do. There's, there's a video, um, you'll get all this in the newsletter and books and articles that you can take all this on. It's just a, a real snapshot of what's out there, but please do access it because it is a fascinating area now for all of us. Okay, thank you.